Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to this presentation. Um, as David's already said, uh, this is one of many presentations which have been undertaken for the Hazard 2020 campaign. Uh, so this, this presentation, as mentioned, is focusing clearly just on ground conditions for safe use of cranes. So the, um, the Queensland Code of Practice and Australian Standards 2550 uh, provide a lot of detail on ground conditions and provide detail on various soil calculations, etc., to determine relevant pad sizes for outriggers. Uh, my part of the presentation is not going to be focusing on that component. I'm just going to be focusing on ground conditions and some common themes and issues which are picked up while we're actually uh, undertaking audits. And hopefully um, some of this won't be new to people, but uh, hopefully it'll be, give people a bit of an insight about uh, what we need to be looking at. So as far as uh, what criteria may apply, so as you can see by that list, there's quite a lot. So the, um, the hierarchs, so project specific risk assessments, we need to make sure that we actually have detail in there regarding ground conditions, et cetera. Uh, we need to make sure we have uh, adjacent landowners, um, the underground assets, all those sort of things are identified within the project risk register. And then we have uh, WH 13.1, where we talk about emergency preferences. So again, making sure we identify potential emergencies and we got the relevant plans which uh, come into play and what we're going to do in the event of an um, emergency. And then for safe design, so we've got uh, FP2, so ensuring risk assessments undertaken to ensure we have identified and assessed the um, buildability of issues, so where we're going to uh, be setting up the crane, so to speak, location of any structures which may be impacted. And then we have SWIMS, so everyone's aware of SWIMS required for relevant um, safe or high risk activities and cranes are no different being mobile, we need to make sure we've got a relevant swim. So the key key point there though is a relevant swims and site specific. So what we find there a lot of times is it's um, a lot of generic words and it's not site specific. And then we need to make sure that we've got a documented process ensuring that we're looking at the work and it's been undertaken in accordance with the relevant swims. So again, a lot of uh, generic swims are still out there unfortunately, and it's not really highlighting or concentrating on the work that's actually been done on site, which is the whole intent of the SWIMS. And then we've got uh, FP 6.2, so you've got verification of training and introductions into, um, or sorry, induction into say systems of work, which need to be uh, happen for the crane operators, et cetera. And then if we're doing any demolition work, again, we need to look at adjoining structures, materials, demolition sequence, uh, making sure all these have been considered prior to starting demolition, because obviously the, the load's imposed. And then we've got uh, structural alterations, temporary support. So if you can imagine here, we're setting up on a car park or a suspended slab area. In these sort of instances, we need to make sure we have appropriate design, appropriate supporting structures in place, need to make sure we're actually inspecting these systems, making sure that someone competent is actually looking at them and they're being regularly inspected to ensure we don't have collapse. And excavations, excavations again, just ensuring that we're in, we're not setting up near excavations. If we are, we need to make sure that we have appropriate sign off. So we need to make sure that ground conditions are going to support the loads imposed. So if we if we are going to set up near an excavation, for instance, well, then the excavation may require some additional shoring, et cetera, to ensure that the loads which are going to be imposed are not going to affect or collapse the crane. And the same going for precast tilt up. Again, it's about making sure we've identified the associated risks. So someone's done some planning, looking at where we're actually going to be going, where we're going to be moving the actual panels to. So we've done a appropriate lift study plan. And then we've got safe systems of work, looking at the correct um, erection of the panel. So we've got a correct sequence happening of that. So we're not uh, going back and forward unnecessarily. And we get to the end where we don't have the correct panel in place and we can't fit it. So obviously that creates issues with um, having loads suspended longer than what they need to be. And then we have uh, 16.1, so mobile plants specifically. So again, about making sure we've identified the risks associated. We have a specific plant risk assessment relative for the crane. We have safe systems of work for outriggers based on the OIT operational manual itself. We look at underground services. We also have safe systems of work developed for use of mobile cranes, which is uh, today's main topic, really, what we're going to be heading, looking at. Uh, but again, verification of competency for 16.8. And then for checks on the outriggers, part of the inspection program, pre-start checks, etc. So ground compaction need to be considered in as part of the mobile plan. So as as you can see, there's a lot of criteria which could apply to um, 
when an audit's been undertaken. So it's really going to be dependent on the scope of works that you're that's been assessed on your job. That's sorry, that's happening on your job, and the actual audit criteria which is going to or may apply. And depending on what that is, obviously we need to make sure we uh, that's captured. And that, that's captured, as everyone in the system knows, and has been ordered. We, it's about a few things. So making sure we've got it actually documented. So the risk assessment, again, is quite clear. We've got a system in place that ensures. We need to know that the actions we're taking, so sort of checks, inspections, etc., are actually occurring. The SWIMS is relevant for the actual work again. And then we've got records to verify. So it's no good saying something and something occurs, and then we can't provide any evidence of something that actually was done on the day in accordance with whoever's actually signed off the system. So the evidence uh, and the record is very important, which needs to be in place. So the, um, as we can see, there's quite a bit of detail which is required though, sort of going back to that criteria. So depending on the criteria will depend on what level of documentation you're going to have. So as, as we mentioned, um, or David uh, briefly touched on, sort of wider focus on ground conditions. So in March 21, we had the car issue rate for 16.5 specific was up 42% each time it was reviewed. So it's quite a high number. Uh, we did see some improvements though, back to the, towards the end of uh, May, which saw the car rate down to reduce to 34.9%. That's still not, uh, not, not ideal. I'm, I'm certain that everyone would uh, agree to that. Uh, so 7%, still 7.7% higher than previous three year average. So this here sort of to go through, if you look at the actual cars issued, so we've got major and minor. So minor, we started at 15.9% in 2017, then we crept up to, in 2020, up to 20.7. And there with major, we've uh, we've started at 20.1, and then we've crept down to 14.2. So a few things probably can be deduced out of those actual figures itself. So with major, I mean, I'm, my thought is there that we're getting better with the documented process and we're actually getting some implementation done. But with minor, we're still actually finding that the implementation process is not occurring as, as documented in most instances, or the documentation is failing to uh, say what is actually happening out on site. So normally from an uh, auditor's point of view, our train of thought, obviously we look at what you have actually said, but we're also guided by what's actually happening at the workplace at the time. And that will drive some further questioning sometimes as to why we haven't actually captured that process. So with this uh, next slide, we look at the actual um, corrective actions themselves. And it's quite interesting in relation to if you look at the actual number of cars issued against the number of times ordered. So we've got 59, so near 60 cars issued uh, basically for 169 times it's been audited. And out of that, we've got 37% of 37 uh, corrective actions for documentation and 12% for implementation. So 62% of the time the uh, documentation was found to be an issue and 12% of the time we found that uh, just over 20% was an issue. But for both, uh, we have combinations of like 16.9%, so 10 cars are issued uh, for that criteria. But as was mentioned earlier in the piece, this, uh, it still rates quite highly in the actual overall scheme of things. So it's the second highest rating car issued for that particular criteria. Which, um, yeah, which is not good because I mean stability is a key factor for um, crane use, as we know. So co common issues identified when we're out on site, we find that the uh, project risk assessment it uh, doesn't even contain any information on ground conditions. So obviously, from a starting point, it should actually at least identify them. Or we find that the risk register identifies ground conditions, but we don't have any specific controls actually identified. Or we find that controls are very broad, so it might mention sort of ground to be compacted or ground to be inspected, but there's no specificity about how that is to occur. And then we got uh, so no detail on weather events or requirement for reinspection. So some of these crane pads we see are in place for quite some a significant amount of time, and they do get affected by weather. So there should be some detail about what the frequency or what is going to require a reinspection to occur. And then from there, we might have uh, the project risk register does actually contain uh, sufficient information, but then the information hasn't been transferred down into the SWIMS. 
And the SWIMS itself, as we know, is sort of the site-specific component that the uh, workforce is actually working towards. So the SWIMS itself should actually contain that relevant information, but sometimes that gets missed in that uh, review process. And then we find um, some specific engineering reports, uh, but sometimes we find that the engineering report is just predominantly on the actual ground compaction for the footings and foundations, et cetera, and sort of details on the soil class. We actually haven't done any, there's been no um, assessment of the actual compacted area where we got cranes set up or where cranes are actually traveling. So we need to make sure that report does clearly identify the compacted areas. It just doesn't uh, make, uh, doesn't have a, a, a overall statement. We need to be quite clear where the crane is going to be setting up. And report also, again, it doesn't doesn't tell us anything about the reinspection process. So again, if we got a crane, mobile crane is going to be set up in place for quite some time. We need to make sure that there's some uh, detail about weather events if we're going to if it's going to affect the pad, and especially if we've got pads which are built up on a slope to actually level grounds off. So if we have subsidence of the embankment section of the actual pad itself, and we've got cranes set up in that area. Well, hence obviously we need and we've got obvious signs of water runoff. I mean, the question will be asked about what assessment or when was this uh, reassessed for the rain event, which has clearly occurred since the ground was compacted. So it's it's nothing which, um, I say things should be happening, but sometimes we uh, it, the, some of the detail gets a bit uh, left behind. So some of the things we also find as far as not given consideration or appropriate consideration is crane travel paths. So we got cranes uh, which all uh, be because of the actual project, we'll have to traverse around the actual project itself. But we haven't identified or clearly articulated on the drawings or plans itself, or we haven't told the operator about what his travel path is. We have obstructions in the way, we have trenches, we have sloping ground and ground compaction, all issues which we know are going to affect the actual stability of the crane, especially with sloping ground and ground compaction where we've uh, got potentially crane is right on the limit and we said if we have some subsidence and then the crane jolts forward load swings swings out a radius and then crane rolls over so it happens pretty quickly especially in a frantic situation as we know where the actual crane set up so if we're setting up next to uh, excavations pits etc again we need to make sure that it is appropriate we've got enough um, timber pad in place or or dunnage or shoring to actually support the actual excavation and some may think, well, why are we even setting up there? And in some jobs, because the project is so tight, uh, the crane may have to set up there, but it's about a bit, bit of pre-planning to ensure that the excavation has appropriate controls in place to ensure stability for the excavation and the crane itself. And then another point, access required for loading, unloading. So we haven't really assessed the type of loads coming to site or planned for all the, all the loads. We have something out of the ordinary, something of a bigger size or nature. It comes into site and all of a sudden it doesn't fit where we have the normal unloading area. So it has to go somewhere else. So automatically we might have had a designated crane pad set up, but because of uh, the access or the type of load coming onto site, we haven't allowed for that um, particular load and we've had to offload somewhere else. So potentially putting the, the crane at risk of obviously uh, potential because of the ground hasn't been prepared for it. And then having the right crane for the lift and the lift plan clearly identifying the loads to be lifted. So again, having the right crane for the lift, uh, making sure it can pick up the load or it's designed to actually do what it's supposed to do. The lift plan itself we find that the lift plan will just be very generic sometimes. It doesn't con con, uh, sorry, contain all the correct uh, radiuses or loading requirements of where we're actually going to be lifted. So obviously, if we don't have the right size crane, that can then obviously put potential of collapse because of we haven't identified that initially in that process. So there's a lot of things which need to be considered. And I'm not saying this happens all the time, but there's common themes which happen, uh, which we do find. So for the crane setup, so some key things which uh, we don't find happens too well sometimes also. So consultation between the crane contractor and the PC as to actually where they're going to set up. So sometimes come to site, you'd be on site and you'll see the crane roll in and it'll just go and set itself up in a place. And then you ask the question of the principal contractor 
or the, of the crane operator about were they informed that they're going to be setting up in that area? And the answer sometimes is no. So, I mean, that obviously creates a lot of issues or potential issues for both the crane contractor and the principal contractor. So, again, planning about where we're going to set up. No information provided on the ground type, as we mentioned before, we'll have a geotechnical engineer report, but it's not for the actual ground compaction or the actual uh, soil area where we're actually setting the cranes up. So we need to be quite specific sometimes, depending on the actual job, I'm not saying you need a geotech all the time, but it's a matter of ensuring that we have appropriate controls in place for the scope of works being undertaken. Then simple things we find that timbers not in good condition or they haven't been set up level or they're not placed together or timbers are not required size. So the code of practice is quite clear on the minimum sizes of timber. What the code of practice doesn't say though, it doesn't talk about that does it have to be hardwood. We know from an industry point of view and industry common uh, practice in industry, it is hardwood. Uh, doesn't, but the code of practice doesn't specifically uh, mention hardwood. Uh, but obviously hardwood is not going to take on water like softwoods would. So obviously hardwood in good condition should be used. And as far as not being level, I mean, it, they should be level for obvious reasons for uniformity of actually placing the load. And then we have the use of bog mats and use of steel plates. So if we're using these Obviously, they should be in accordance with the relevant manufacturer's requirements, but they should be a relevant size also. So use of steel plates in particular, I mean, you normally you see a 20 mil steel plate on site, but we all know there's all different types of steel. So if we're getting, getting to those sort of uh, requirements where we've got steel plates and we've got bog mats on top of steel plates, etc., you would think that we need an appropriate design to actually go with that. And then simple things about not having the outriggers in the middle of the pad. Again, it might sound obvious, but because they haven't put the, uh, or started uh, putting the pad or put the outrigger out to find out where the pad is, sometimes it has, doesn't quite line up in the middle. So I'm certain if we look at the OEM manual, it talks about being in the middle of the actual, uh, the outrigger being placed in the middle of the pad. Again, for obvious reasons, I mean, I'm not an engineer, but if you look at what the requirements are, you want to place a uniform load across the ground. So that's a whole idea why we're using out, out, sort of the uh, timbers and bog mats, et cetera, for that uniformity. And then uh, continual checking for stability. So in 2550 in particular, we talk about there, they talk about the, um, the verification the crane levels should be made throughout the working day to ensure we don't have any stability or movement of the crane itself. So they say, they've actually mentioned that the verification is supposed to be made immediately before and immediately um, after load is lifted, which is equal to or greater than 50% of the uh, crane's rated capacity. So again, it's a simple inspection, and most of the times you'll see the uh, outriggers go up, go down, and they will set up the crane and they'll do a walk around. The crane driver will do a walk around, which is uh, which makes makes sense. I mean, they're, they're the one putting themselves in the actual machine, but I mean, the stand is quite clear that that should happen. So they should be checking. And then after they've done the load, again, there should be another check about the process that we haven't had any subsidence. And if it has been some subsidence, well, then maybe it's a matter of making the um, bearing area bigger than what it actually needs to be, or sorry, bigger than what it was previously to ensure that we uh, uh, distribute that load more evenly across the actual uh, ground itself. So, so in summary, there's there's a lot which goes into it, but the, the starting point, as with any activity, should really be the planning. So it's about knowing the load being lifted. We need to make sure we have an area identified if we actually have to unload loads and be prior to actually putting them into place. We need to make sure we got travel paths and making sure that travel paths have been prepared and they're actually maintained. We have the right crane for the actual uh, job. So to, to do all this, the only way this can really happen is consultation. So to plan successful, you must consult with all relevant stakeholders. So relevant stakeholders will go obviously be the crane supplier, the people involved in actually uh, erecting whatever's been lifted, the actual logistics people, so whoever's actually delivering the loads, et cetera. So there's a number of key stakeholders which uh, would potentially be involved in that consultation process. And the more complex the lift, the more detail the consultation required. So, and that would be expected in, in, to be seen in the actual, in your risk project risk register, et cetera, or some form of documentation, and then put into 
the actual on-site process, so the SWIMS or relevant um, JSA, etc. So as we can see, there's, there's a number of items that need to be considered to ensure a safe lift. And if we do all this, hopefully the crane will stay upright as we expect it to be. And that's, uh, that's it from me. Thanks for uh, listening.